Welcome to the second of five webinars that have been developed as a collaboration between La Trobe University and the Victorian Department of Education. The Victorian Department of Education commissioned a series of live workshops that have been held across Victoria for many months prior to today. Um, and the agenda for those workshops was based on recommendations that arose from the review for the program uh, for students with disabilities. A series of five webinars have been designed as a follow-on opportunity to continue the discussion about how best to support students with learning difficulties, including dyslexia. And this second webinar examines spelling and concludes with uh, a spelling analysis task that we will aim to do together online. This is the team. Uh, we, together we have collaborated, produced the web, uh, sorry, the slides and they've done the workshops. I am your presenter today. I'm, my name is Dr Tanya Seri and I'm a senior lecturer at La Trobe University. If you were logged in yesterday, um, there were some online polls. Today there won't be any online polls but there'll be a couple of slides with some self-checks where I'm asking you to recap on what, you've dis what we've discussed so far. Uh, the structure of today uh, will be as follows. We'll have a warm up to spelling and then back to some basic basics about spelling. Um, we'll talk briefly about how spelling grows. It's important for us to understand the process of how children learn to become competent spellers so that we can identify when things are going wrong for some of our students. We'll put it all together with an analysis and a brief intervention plan as well. For the live workshops, um, these were the key topics or themes that were had a thread right throughout uh, the entire day for the workshops. In this webinar, we're going to focus again on uh, systematic synthetic phonics, but this time applying it to spelling as opposed to decoding of words. But I think these other themes come very strongly through when we talk about spelling as well. The importance of explicit instruction for teaching students how to spell based on evidence, um, the importance of oral language competency. The more words we know, the easier it is for us to learn to spell them. And similarly, as I said yesterday, what I talk about is important for all students, but absolutely critical for those who have learning challenges. As a warm up, um, so we don't make errors like this poor painter who's spelt the word incorrectly and probably has to go back and paint it again. I'd like to just acknowledge that uh, the research um, and a lot of the focus is on reading and uh, writing tends to get a little bit of a, a, a less focus. It's like spelling and then writing by, in, by extension. I like the poor cousins of reading. Um, but it's really important that we think about spelling, which is obviously the way into writing. Uh, spelling is incredibly important for all of um, our students' academic tasks. Uh, and we need to think about how children go from early scribbles, which are absolutely appropriate during the preschool years, to becoming um, a competent speller who can spell a vast array of words. Spelling in these days is extremely important for not just academic tasks, but engaging in social banter, such as tweeting, texting, and the like. If we position spelling, um, thinking about it as uh, a lower order process, lower order processes and higher order processes, for example, out of a, an education context could be, we need to learn how to hit a backhand and a forehand as the lower order process before we can then go and play a game of tennis. In the same way, decoding is a lower order process, critical for being able to read for meaning. And similarly, spelling is the lower order process that allows us to become writers, which is a much more generative process. Spelling itself simply refers to being able to symbolise a phoneme uh, with a plausible letter or letter combination. And why is spelling so important? I think that in many, many of us could think of some key reasons why it's so important, particularly if we're working with students in classrooms. Uh, but if we think about it according to this diagram, where we're wanting students from about mid-primary right through uh, education and beyond, a lot of what they are asked to do is to write extended text of various genres, styles, and so forth. And once again, we, only, we all of us have a, a limited cognitive capacity. So if we can draw a line here so that uh, this smaller section can become the area that focuses or helps students um, use accurate spelling and punctuation conventions, essentially all of the orthographic conventions to write, it means that uh, students have much more cognitive resource available to them for generating writing um, 
regardless of the genre, being able to use cohesive linguistic devices, a broad vocabulary, complex language, and of course, meeting the needs of the task. If students aren't competent spellers, that dotted line gets shifted across to the middle more, and it means that there is less cognitive resource for students to focus on what is essentially the higher order or the key task at hand. Uh, this came from a, a really uh, useful survey, another reason why spelling is so important beyond just thinking about school students. A survey found that 75% of employers are put off a job application or a candidate if that application has poor spelling or poor grammar. And it was determined that recruiters spend an average of about just over three minutes reading a candidate's resume, and they've typically made up their minds within the first minute. And nearly 60% of all recruiters will typically reject a candidate's application because of poor grammar and or poor spelling. So it has significant ramifications, not just for school success, but ongoing. So this little guy obviously hasn't had a lot of success getting jobs. Now let's just think about some basic basics when we are talking about spelling, and uh, that will prepare us well for going on to do the analysis. I thought this cartoon said it well. Did you hear that they've invented this amazing thing called spell check? I certainly remember when spell check became a thing. Um, it was quite a while ago and was pretty excited about it, even though I've always been a competent speller. But we actually know that spell check doesn't pick up all of the errors, especially if the attempted target form that a student types in is quite different to the um, expected form. Uh, spell check really only picks up between 30 and about 70% of errors, so we can't rely just on spell check alone. I think that there was a view that that could be a huge um, solution to many uh, people's, adults and children's spelling, but in fact we still need to have the basics about spelling well ingrained. When we think about spelling, we might think of letters, as you can see on the screen, but we need to get away from letters. We literally need to divorce ourselves from letters when we're thinking about spelling. We need to start thinking about all of these terms. Many of these terms will be very familiar to you. Um, the, notion, the term singleton, I've just used to refer to a single letter uh, that refers to a sound. Um, but what I really want to draw our attention to are thinking about uh, the distinction between digraphs and then tri and quadgraphs compared to consonant blends or clusters. And I'd also like to spend some time thinking about the schwa, which is a vowel. It's called the neutral vowel. Singletons are the basics. Uh, we can have them as vowels or consonants, such as the a in cat and the a in cup, or the p in pie, and that can appear at the middle of the word or the end of the word, z in zoo. Then we have digraphs, and a digraph is defined as two letters that go together but just make one sound or one phoneme. They, of course, can appear as consonants and vowels as well. So I've some examples here, the a in pay and the oo in zoo, but that oo might also be book, um, the oo in book. Uh, the consonants might be the sh sound in shoe and the m sound in this, the, the, the hard or the voiced sound the, and that th can also be articulated as the softer sound as in the word thing, this thing is hard. We then have trigraphs and quad, quadgraphs. Trigraphs are three letters that go together to make one sound or one phoneme. Uh, there's more vowels than consonants both for trigraphs and quadgraphs. Vowel trigraphs, for example, include the IGH, which says I, the EAU for some words, O as in uh, bureau or bow. Consonants, the CH in match and the SCH in schnitzel. That is a word that we have stolen from the German language. So SCH in German is always pronounced SH. So in some words in our language, such as school, the SCH isn't SH, but in some words it is SCH uh, schnitzel. And quadgraphs, I couldn't think of any consonant quadgraphs. If anyone has any, I'd love to hear them. But the few examples that I came across were the A in eight and the O in bow, which may also be OO in through. Then we have consonant blends. Uh, I find that people uh, interchange consonant blend and consonant cluster. As long as we're talking about the same thing, I don't think it matters which term we use. But this is when we have two sounds, or sometimes three sounds, as you can see in the bottom line, that just put together as consonants without anything in between. But they constitute two separate sounds. So in initial position, for example, we have the blue in the BL in blue, the cr in cry, 
In final position, the jump, uh, the mp in jump, and the nd nd as in and and hand. And there are a small number of uh, consonant blends that consist of three letters, scr as in scratch, and str as in strap as examples. Now where it's really important to make the distinction is between digraphs, which are two letters making one sound or one phoneme, and consonant blends, two sounds, sometimes three sounds, that make two or three actual individual consonants. So these three, digraphs, trigraphs and quadra quadgraphs, all just refer to one single phoneme. So there is a lot of complexity, as we know, in our language. We know there are 26 letters, five vowels and 21. Uh, consonants, but that's never going to be sufficient for our knowledge of teaching children how to spell. We do know, importantly, that of those 26 letters, there are 44 phonemes in Australian English. If you look at texts from American English or British English, they vary slightly, but it's around 42 to 44. But in Australian English, we have 20 vowels that we manage to extract from our five written letter vowels and 24 consonants. And we have over 200 graphemes, or two, over 200 ways to represent those 44 phonemes. So there is complexity there, and that's where an explicit instruction approach will really assist all children to, to optimise their spelling ability. A grapheme, by definition, is the smallest linguistic unit that carries meaning in a writing system. For example, the word bat, but at, um, has those three sounds, but if we take the b away and replace it with a p sound, we have p at. So we have a different word. It carries meaning. So the b and the p in that, in that example are two separate graphemes because by changing the grapheme, we change the, completely the meaning of the word. As we know, there are multiple ways to represent the many phonemes that we have in our English language, and the schwa vowel is highlighted because we're going to talk about it next, and it's really important. On the top of the screen on the right hand corner is the phonetic transcription of the schwa vowel. It looks like an upside down E. It's called the neutral vowel. And if you practice saying it, it's literally when you open your mouth and just let some sound fall out. So if you're comfortable, have a go at it now. It would be something like this, uh. Literally nothing is moved in your mouth. The tongue doesn't move, the lips don't move, the jaw doesn't move. It's the, called the neutral vowel because everything in the mouth is absolutely neutral. And I'd like to spend some time talking about schwa because um, it's a mysterious vowel, despite the fact that it is m the most used vowel that we um, speak with and the least understood vowel. So keeping in mind that it is the neutral vowel that we don't have to really move anything in our mouth to produce. Um, if we take the word department, as in department of education, that is the orthographic representation, everyone would be comfortable that that's how we spell department. And I'd like you now to say it out loud um, at the screen, department. If we break it into syllables, three syllables, department, what I'd like you to do now is to uh, underline which syllable you think is the uh, stressed syllable. Okay, so hopefully you selected part. Now, we say department like this. You can see that I've substituted the vowel on two occasions because there are two unstressed vowels and I've replaced it with the schwa vowel. If you listen to me saying it, I'm going to try and say it as naturally as I can, but it's department. I'm not saying it, how it appears in the written or orthographic form. It's not department. That would sound robotic and odd and awkward. We say department, department. So there is a, a really important point there that students might attempt to transcribe or write the sounds that they're hearing, um, but they're not really, they don't really have a correlate to what the schwa vowel is. So the schwa needs to be explained to students, and that gives us a great opportunity to talk about stressed and unstressed vowels. And that sometimes when we see a word written, we don't say it as it sounds. We sometimes have a, an unstressed vowel, such as de and mint in that word. Okay, so on the next uh, slide, I'd like you to say this word as it comes naturally to you. Uh, in doing so, I'd like you to again identify one or two syllables in this word that are stressed. There might, depending on the way you say it, there might be one or there might be two. So if uh, you said it with, um, uh, sorry, yeah, if you said it with, uh, in this way, it would be departmental. In fact, there's, sorry, there's three um, stressed syllables. I'm going to a departmental review meeting so soon. I'm going to a departmental. 
So it's just that last syllable that is unstressed. Others might have said it as depart departmental, de sorry, um, departmental. I've got a departmental review, departmental. So the part and the ment are stressed, but the first and the last syllable have the schwa next to it. So again, some added complexity that we need to be very aware of when we're teaching students and giving them strategies to t uh, for their writing. Some resource slides on the next two um, pages, just about the different consonant phonemes. Here are the 24 consonants of Australian English and some the 20 vowels with some of the alternate spellings. But you can see down at the bottom, I've referred to the neutral vowel or the schwa and referred to it as um, it doesn't have a spelling equivalent, but we use this vowel more than any other vowel for spoken language and it is used for the unstressed syllable. So here's a recap. Uh, I've got four questions over two slides, so I'll put the question up, give you a moment to respond and then show you the answer with an explanation. So first one, consonant digraphs are also known as clus consonant clusters or blends. Okay, I won't spend too long waiting, so I'm happy for you to just pause the screen, but the answer is false. Consonant digraphs are, sep are very distinct. Consonant digraphs, two letters making one sound or one phoneme. Consonant clusters, two consonants uh, that go together, but we say them as two individual sounds, like b l in blue. Uh, in this one, uh, which two words contain contains a, dry, a trigraph? Which two words contain a trigraph? Where you've got um, an example where there's three letters that, that sit together, consonants, and um, they are forming one phoneme. So if you'd like to pause, um, I'll put the answer up now. Uh, dispatch and discourteous. We've got the ch consonant trigraph and the er in discourteous uh, in this, the second syllable. Some people might have wanted to go to the end, the E-O-U-S, discourteous, but in fact there's actually three sounds there if we say it as we, if we listen to the sounds, discourteous. The er, O-U is produced as a schwa, so that is not a, an, any, an example of a trigraph. So in that one, the ch consonant and the O-U-R, discourteous. On the next slide, which one does not contain a trigraph? There's one word on the screen, A, B, C, D, that does not contain a trigraph. And the answer is instruct. And to demonstrate, we have sh in schnauzer, S-C-H, T-C-H, ch in itchy, which could be itch as well, and smidge, the D-G-E, smidge as well. And the last one, this is just a true-false, the spelling pattern TCH and CH often say the same sound. And the answer is true. It's some examples, we have match, sketch and which, and chip, which and teacher. And there are some rules that we can teach students about when to use the TCH and when to use the CH as well. Again, if anyone would like some more resources, please contact me offline. Essentially, we need to acknowledge, though, that it's easier to read or decode words accurately than it is to spell them. And that's because when we've got a word in front of us that we're trying to decode, we've got at least something to work with. So if you had this word, which isn't a, a simple word, the word science, uh, there are many ways that you could attack that or students might attack that without knowing the word first. They might say science, sky and sky, and then maybe get there. There's something at least to work with. We need to teach students that many words, the S, C at the start of a word often says just the S sound, apart from words like scarf, but very often the S, C says uh, the S sound. Um, but if we ask the student to write the word, science, if you close your eyes and just say the word, there are many, many options that could come up. Um, we, the student will hear sigh, and then they'll hear the ns at the end, and that uh, hashtag, is actually where the schwa is, science. So you can see there that there's more complexity in to spell than to read a word. Although they're kind of um, inverse cousins of each other, uh, reading has got something at least tangible that students can start working with where with spelling we're going from nothing and trying to create something. 
it's really important. We've talked about some of the uh, really useful and valuable things about spelling for academic purposes and well beyond. So knowing the conventions of how um, the language is spelt helps with word recognition. So it assists also with decoding and certainly is very important for extended writing. Some key facts about reading. Uh, I think these will be very uh, familiar to people, but just again, to set the scene. It's not a natural process like it is learning to speak. It's a learned process. Those of you who have been to a workshop will be familiar with the term biologically secondary. Learning to spell is a biologically secondary skill that needs to be taught explicitly. It's not something that we just acquire as we get older and go through our school years. It is certainly not a process of just memorizing whole words. Um, it is best taught explicitly um, so that we're teaching students about the linguistic aspects of spelling and a statement such as the following by Goodman, who wrote, children learn spelling without direction and instruction if they read and write. Another way of saying just immerse them and they will learn to spell is not, we know that that is not the case anymore. So we know that students need to be explicitly taught how to spell and just leaving them immersed in wonderful rich literature is never going to get most students over the line and be competent spellers. We have a couple of generations when this was the focus, a couple of generations of extraordinarily capable people who will say, um, I've always been a poor speller. And that's very much the reason why. Uh, yesterday, if you had tuned in, you would have seen us do this poll, estimate the percentage of words in English that have an irregular spelling. Uh, I'll put this up and I'll show you the results from yesterday, um, only because I want to reinforce the fact, first of all, these are, these are the results. Um, you can see there was a huge spread across uh, from heaps of irregular words to not that many regular words. And those that selected E, less than 20%, were quite much more correct. In fact, we know that there's a much more regularity in English spelling or English words than many, many people think. So once again, we can teach children a lot about rules and patterns and actually students learn a lot just through what's called statistical learning or just learning the patterns of how words often look on the page. And I'll come to show you that shortly. But to, again, just as a reminder that we don't have as nearly as many irregular words in English than many of us think. And that's a really important case for why learning to spell should not be a process of memory, rote, rote memory, particularly when the words on a word list that children might be asked to take home and learn and, and rehearse and come back and spell on a test, especially if there's no connections between those words, it's actually going to be quite a futile task. They're just not going to hold on to um, a random list of words. So how does uh, sp spelling actually grow? Um, if we think about the constructivist theory aligned with much more of a whole language ap approach, akin to what I just showed you before when I put a big cross through the line, that's when we ask students to make or construct their own knowledge about how the spelling system works. And the thinking was that young children would gradually build their own hypotheses about how the writing system works well before formal instruction at school. They're putting a lot of expectation on families and kindergarten teachers to help children do this. Um, but as posited by Dewey, who said, children learn best when they discover the principles behind the system by actively using it. This is not supported by research evidence. And it, it's akin to yesterday when we talked about um, not leaving reading to chance in exactly the same way. We can't leave spelling to chance. We need to teach children how to spell. Um, I'm going to show you now stage theory, uh, which has been around for um, probably since the turn of the century by Linnea Airy, who first proposed the stage theory. Um, the pre-phonological stage refers to the kind of scribbles that children make prior to school. They're absolutely beautiful, um, really important in pre-writing skills, but essentially they bear little or no relationship to the actual phonology of the word. Um, the partial phonological stage, which is apparent in the early years of children's school life, um, the, what the realised word the, the student has written may still look quite distant from the target form. There may be some, some aspects that might be correct, but they may not reflect all of the elements of the word. They haven't got full understanding of how all of the sounds and letters map onto each other, but there is some reflection of phonology, hence the name, partial phonological stage. The full alphabetic stage, children have moved much further on. They would be able to map all of the consonant and vowel relationships um, in words, but they haven't learned some of the more sophisticated pieces of knowledge, such as lots of the trigraph, quad graphs, and maybe how um, when morphemes are added to words, bound morphemes, how the spelling might change. So they're getting very close and consolidated is, is when a student is a competent speller. 
It's these two, partial and full, that we will really look for when I show you the spelling sample shortly. Uh, if we think about the partial or that early phonological stage, some of the reasons that students are having difficulty, which are important to identify because it then in informs us about our teaching and or intervention, students may not have a complete awareness of all the elements in the word. So the word story might be realised as S-O-R-E-Y, so they haven't heard the consonant blend. Similarly, fly might be phi, so once again omitting the second part of the consonant blend. In the word jumped, you can, once again, they've um, missed out one of the two elements of the m per blend. Um, and they've also changed the ed just to the t sound because that's actually how it is spoken. I jumped on the bed. If you say that to yourselves, you'll hear that we actually say it with a t sound even though the spelling is ed. So there's some really important learning for that last example about the past tense morpheme as well. Uh, students might, their writing might reflect shortcuts because they're just hearing the salient or the really loud sounds. So dog might be g or dg, dog, because the consonants take up more sound than the vowel. Um, the word beaver might be bva if we're Australian speakers, beaver. And if we're American speakers, it might be beaver, bvr, because they have the final r sound. But once again, taking shortcuts, doing a really good go at it, but having some, uh, some of the less salient sounds missing, and certainly the vowels, which are the most challenging part to learn to spell. And there might be uh, divergence between how we say a word and how it, it's actually written, just like jumped that I talked about above. If you say dogs, again, we say a z sound at the end of dogs, which is what this example shows. Uh, truck, if you say truck, we don't actually say truck, we say truck. Um, so we might see CH instead of the TR as well. And there's some other examples. I went, I like to ski. We often don't say ski, we say ski. We have all these sounds working together. Um, so it actually, the curt sound ends up sounding a bit like a, a G. Similarly, footy, footy sounds, the T sounds a bit like a D. So again, you can play around and practice saying those words so you can hear how, how um, the, the, there is a slight divergence between how we say the word and how it's actually spelled. But typically what we see are omissions, substitutions, simplifications, and sometimes intrusions, extra letters that are added in. Once it's full alphabetic spelling, the, the spelling is far more accurate because students are much further on in their learning and mastery of the letter sound conventions. They do draw on their statistical learning, meaning that they have had a lot of experience reading and spelling, and they can start to see some patterns, uh, some patterns about the way that uh, spelling, pat uh, spelling le letters go together. Um, spellings are very, in this stage, typically plausible even when they're incorrect. For example, um, I did have a student who wrote the word hiked like this, um, so it, wouldn't, it should have been like this with the, the correct version, but it's, it, it's conceivable to understand how this first version, the longer version, could conceivably be seen as correct. And of course, consolidated alphabetic is when we have sophisticated knowledge, which we know is really important for our, our ongoing success. Um, I talked about statistical learning, so I just want to show you a couple of examples of the sorts of knowledge that we um, kind of get from uh, practicing and reading words and also can be taught. For example, the short e vowel um, is much more commonly um, spelt as single e, e than the e, e a sound. So we have wed, wet, fetter and rest with the e sound, but we still do have red and lead. So the e, the e is typically con, um, realised or spelled as the E letter more commonly than the EA. So children will just start to Im learn that that's the typical pattern, but know that there are some exceptions. The sh when we have EA as the short vowel, it's typically um, before a D rather than a B sound. So we have head instead and dead, but again, an exception, we have bed. Similarly, the short E when it's just the E sound is much more common before a B than a D as these examples, web, deb, pleb, tell us. The long I sound um, is more commonly represented as IGH, the trigraph, uh, when it's followed by a T. So we have fight, where we have find, fright instead of fried, and sight in, and side, but we still have sight um, in different, uh, another homophone as in S-I-T-E, the, the building site. So there's lots of statistical learning that goes on as children continue to be engaged with tasks around spelling and writing. What that really tells us is um, spelling is not done phoneme by phoneme or letter by letter. Learning to spell involves sophisticated knowledge about the phonological system and also the broader linguistic system and morphology comes into that in a, a very big way as, as spelling words become more complex. 
This is from the bulletin, and anyone who is a member of DSF, um, Dyslexia Spell Foundation out of um, Western Australia, will have ac uh, may have seen this, but all of you have access freely um, downloadable on the website on the bottom of the screen. There's a lot of information here. I'd want you just to take note at the moment of the colours, um, but this is a, a useful article if you'd like to download it. Um, and the colours all re reflected these six elements that are essential skills in learning to spell. Phonological awareness and phonics, spelling conventions and spelling patterns, metacognitive mem skill and memory, grammar, and semantic knowledge and etymology or word roots. They've got this really neat graph that I found very useful. Again, if you can go back and think about the colour connections, um, and their K um, refers to kinder, and then PP is pre-prep, but their first year of formal school. Um, but you can see here at the second year of school, the main focus is on teaching students phonological awareness and phonics and higher order skills such as lots of the conventions of spelling um, patterns and thinking about the grammar and the semantics. There's a small amount of focus, but not that much. By the time students are towards mid and upper primary, it's actually balanced out a lot more. So it assumes that phonological awareness and phonics is far more mastered and more attention can be directed to the higher order skills. And that pattern really continues in the next year and right through. So that was a really neat graph to just also show the progression of, of the focus of teaching children to spell. So let's now, now start with our analysis. Um, I've got an example here, and those of you who attended uh, in one of the live workshops that went for the full day will have this resource at the end of module two. Uh, we didn't work through it in the full day, but it was there as a resource, and I've, I've decided to use this as our spelling task today. So this is Mikey, who's 10 and a half years old. He has had a full assessment of the South Australian spelling test, and his equivalent spelling age is well below his chronological age. So I've got two slides that I'm going to ask you to work through. I'm probably going to go a bit faster than you'll be able to keep up, but there might be some need to stop and start the screen as well. So this is how the task will work. The target word was jam, and he spelt j uh, j uh, m jam. And in the next two in the next two columns, I've asked you to identify are the correct number of syllables reflected, and in this case, yes, and it's easy because there is only one syllable, and are the correct number of phonemes reflected, and in this case, yes, j a m is three, j a m is three, so he's reflected the correct number of phonemes, so that's a good start, um, but it's not correctly spelt, and in this case, there is a medial vowel error, so he's showing vowel confusion, in this case, uh, between two short vowels, not uncommon at all, and he's showing spelling that's at the partial alphabetic stage. So that's the process I'm going to ask you to go through for the list of words um, that you'll see here. The first column is the target word on the test, and the second column in bold is his attempt to spell. So I'd like you now just to pause the screen and complete just the next two columns. Are the correct number of syllables reflected, and are the correct number of phonemes reflected? So pause the screen, I'll just wait about 30 seconds, but then I'll go through the answers shortly. Okay, the third column, correct number of syllables were all yes. In fact, all of them except the last word beautiful only had one syllable, um, but three of the words on this, this page in the second, uh, the fourth column, were the correct number of phonemes represented? Uh, no. So I'll just explain dart is three sounds. De art. He's, he's added, had an additional letter. De artst. Okay, so he's represented four phonemes. Um, who and how. Um, and beautiful, um, he has not re uh, represented the correct number of phonemes either. Um, if you've got any questions, email me separately or when you spend some time thinking it through. I just haven't got a lot of time to go through it all right at this minute because what I now want you to do is then go through on the next page, the next column, uh, are they correct? Well, all of them will be no because there are lots of errors there. And to start thinking about the type of sound error or errors that um, Mikey is making. So let's think about beg, which became we don't know if he meant bug or buge from the spelling. It could be either. So I've said no, it's not correct. He's got an error in the medial vowel position. So once again, vowel confusion. He may have made an error with the soft G and hard G. The target has a beg, the hard G. And because he's put the E on the end, it looks like it could be buge. 
um, and that again is partial alphabetic stage. Dart to becoming, becoming dust. Um, again, medial vowel in error. So there is once again vowel confusion and he's had an intruding additional consonant. Uh, who and how, there is an ordering error, um, but there are, these are two words that are high frequency as well. So he might have just made an error because he's learned both of those words and just written the wrong one down, or he might have actually just got the ordering out of whack as well. But who and how, we might imagine that as a 10 year old, he's seen and heard those words many times. Loud um, is incorrect. Um, it's hard to know what's gone on here exactly, but there is an additional E in there. We assume that the student has written it to say loud. Um, so my assessment at this stage is that he has overextended the use of the ED morpheme as if it was jumped, um, but he's tried to put the ED morpheme on the word loud. To be really convinced about that, I'd obviously need to see many more samples of his writing, but that's my assessment from this example here. Fight, um, he's got ordering um, the letters incorrectly. So again, lacks the conventional knowledge of that I, G, H and T ending. He's just flipped them around. Any, again, a highly frequent word, um, but the, again, partial alphabetic stage. He's spelled um, phonetically very regular, um, but it's a high frequency word that you would imagine that he would know by this stage. Um, but he's just written it quite um, as a, at a very phonetic level. Shaw, he's written as show. Shaw is a tricky word. Um, he's heard the first sound correctly because he's reflected the SH um, and he's made a big error on the vowels again. You can see a common thread around vowels and that's very typical for many struggling spellers because vowels can be the bane for lots of spellers. Um, but again, sure is likely to be a high frequency word. Now beautiful um, is also, I would, I'd call that partial alphabetic. Um, he's made phonetically regular substitutions on two of the three vowels that are there. So the E-A-U in beautiful, he's just put as a U, and then you can see that there's other errors as well. Okay, I am going to move to the next slide. The process is going to be exactly the same. Uh, the words, as the test does, are much more complex, and most of them are multisyllabic words. So here are the target words for, I'll just take you through this example. Orchestra, he's written as, I don't know if he's met, it's, or Ukrista or Ukrista, it's hard to know. So once again, he has reflected all the correct syllables. I can't be confident from the spelling if he's meant it, uh, the, the, te the stress is on the right syllable, orchestra, so it should be Ukrista as he's written, but he has reflected three syllables, but he has not reflected the correct number of phonemes. Um, again, I've called this partial alphabetic stage with many vowel and const uh, consonant substitutions and one omission, and lacking some knowledge about word origin, that in this word, the CH coming from um, Italian roots, the CH is produced as a K sound, and he's just um, sit, put the K sound, the letter C, instead of the CH. So he hasn't learned a lot about the etymology of certain words. So once again, here are the words that he was asked to write and his version in bold. Um, so I'll ask you to uh, go through the correct syllables and correct numbers of phonemes. Again, there'll be m many more errors in the syllables. I'll just give you a few minutes to go through, a few seconds, I'm sorry, to go through that. And let me take you through my responses. Pink highlights error. Equally, equally, uh, put yes and yes for that. Appreciate has become arpachate. Um, so he's left out a whole syllable. Uh, familiar, familiar. Formally, um, it might be formalia. We don't really know from that spelling. Enthusiastic, this is a tricky one. It's a hard to say, so I'm not actually gonna give it a go, but I have put question marks because it was, it was difficult to actually decode his attempt at spelling the word. Signature is probably signature. So I'd mark that as correct number of syllables and correct number of phonemes. And I can explain that offline if anyone would like me to explain that. Permanent, he's clearly left out one whole syllable and sufficient. Um, I've again been a bit sitting on the fence and said probably it might be sufficient, it might be sufficienty. It's hard to actually know without asking him to read it back. So now let me take you through the errors. If you'd like to pause, if you're watching offline when it's not live, you might like to pause and try the to identify the sound letter pattern errors. Uh, but if we're watching online, um, they're all going to be no under the correct column because 
not one word is spelt correctly. But again, partial alphabetic stage in equally, he's demonstrated that he lacks knowledge about when to use doublets or double, uh, double letters. Um, so that also brings into question his knowledge of how morphology impacts on uh, adding a suffix, impacts on spelling. Appreciate, again, partial, not all syllables are represented. So that's quite a few steps back besides what else he has to um, learn. So I'm just getting my five minute warning. Um, uh, so appreciate, um, appreciate. So there's, he really is not reflecting the sound in its actual form in, in no, a number of ways. Um, he's uh, put a ch for the what is articulated as an sh. So we would need to um, find out about with what he knows about the ch as a digraph. That's usually a ch sound. Familiar is formally or formalia. We don't really know. Um, but some phonetic sounds are represented because we've got a f and a m and a l. But again, vowels are where he's really falling down. Um, once again, poor awareness of sounds and syllables in the word. So partial alphabetic stage at best. Enthusiastic is quite problematic uh, for the reasons that we know that it's hard to actually read what he said. We do have some of the sounds in the word represented in graphic form, but nth, nth, is never at the beginning of words in English. So again, statistical learning has not really kicked in for this word for Mikey. We never have any words in English starting with nth. That's what we call an illegal phonological pattern in English. So that is quite a problematic example of his spelling. Signature has been a quite a, phon a phonetic, a, a good t attempt at representing it phonetically. There's lots and lots of more sophisticated knowledge that Mikey needs. So again, some phonetic sounds are represented. You can see the s sound and the ch sound. If you say signature, um, it's not signature. We say signature as the natural way we speak. So he's attempted and reflected quite correctly some of the consonants, but uh, again, vowels and particularly the ending, the ER ending for the URE ending, he needs to be taught a lot about that. Permanent, we've noted already that um, he's left out one syllable of the word. Typically, if a syllable will be left out, it will be the um, an unstressed syllable, which he's done, permanent. Um, he's left out that medial uh, unstressed syllable. And sufficient. Some phonetic sounds are represented, but there's some intrusions. There's a long vowel in surf instead of sufficient. So he's made that first syllable from a unstressed syllable into a stressed syllable by making a long vowel and, and lots of other errors in there, but has, again, heard some of the sounds. He has represented um, the sufficient, the SH, with SH in his version. So it's very much at the partial alphabetic stage as well. So that was a quick summary. I think the best way to make use of this is to go through it and stopping and starting the screen. And any queries, please email me offline. I'll collect everyone's queries and perhaps put out a, a document for everyone to see. Um, but let's sum up now. Um, I'm sorry, I'll just have a couple of immediate targets before we sum up. Immediate targets just from this sample. And again, we would need more evidence before we really formulate true goals for Mikey. But let's assume we have a lot more knowledge. The immediate targets are for Mikey to have accurate syllabic awareness for all multisyllabic words, to have phonemic awareness for all regular grapheme phoneme correspondences, to differentiate between all short vowels at an auditory level, because we saw many examples when he was confusing short vowels, to be able to recode or spell all short vowels in CBC words accurately, to accurately use 10 common spelling patterns for di, tri and quad graphs, such as the IGH, followed by a T ending, to avoid what we saw as the inversion error in the word fight, to accurately spell high frequency words such as sure and any. Whilst I'm advocating that there's a lot that can be taught about spelling, there certainly will be some words that are high frequent, occur frequently and do need to be uh, learned. Broader targets as he goes on. It's a bit hard to predict because we don't know how he'll respond to the immediate targets, but he does need some work on his knowledge about the origins of word, words or etymology. He needs mastery of long vowels and how to represent them in the multiple ways that they can be represented. When to use double letters versus single letters and spelling of bound morphemes when they add on to words. In some t words, they make no, they just get added on. In some, the spelling is actually changed. So that's where I'd be looking longer term for goals for Mikey spelling. So now in sum, we've talked about the fact that fluent and accurate spelling knowledge is a critical precursor, a lower order skill for being able to write. Um, in, in the early stages of learning to spell, 
phonological and phonemic awareness are closely linked. If you think back to that nice chart with the six colours going across from kinder right through to end of school. Systematic synthetic phonics instruction benefits students throughout primary school in order to teach, uh, to reach consolidated spelling in the same way that we teach decoding. And error analysis, as we've just done a very small snapshot of, is um, vital to determine teaching targets and intervention plans. It's much more helpful to analyse what the errors are rather than just getting a score or correct and an age equivalent. Those things tell us there might be a problem but don't tell us exactly where to go. So in, in, uh, in finishing, I'd like to thank you all very much for your, your time, your attention. And uh, if you'd like to contact any of us by email, our addresses are there and we all, most of us are fairly active on Twitter as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>